Hey everyone, welcome to After Buzz on Mark Kendall, guitarist for Great White. We're going to talk to him about their new album, Full Circle, and a lot more, so stick around. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. Welcome to Spotlight On. I'm Christian Blatt on Twitter, at ChristianDMZ, and I also host... The Blackcast at Blackcast on Twitter, B L A D T C A S T. And what you're hearing right now is indeed from Full Circle, the new Great White album. And I'm joined here in our studio by Mark Kendall, Great White. Thanks so much for taking the drive out to beautiful North Hollywood, Mark. Thanks for having me, man. Awesome. Absolutely. And the first song we're hearing right now is Big Time, and we don't need to turn it down yet. There's no reason to turn <laughs> it down. This is the the lead single, as they say, and there's a video for this. Yeah. And I guess in this day and age, the place to find videos is on YouTube. Uh, you know, that's exactly that's like our MTV today. Yeah, YouTube. <laughs> but in a way that's so much better than MTV. If it's like, oh, I, I, I want to see the video for that new Great White song. I want to see, sure. you know, which of my favorite bands might have videos. It's a lot easier. You just type it in and you find it. So right. Yeah. You're you're at least keeping your already informed fans aware of what's going on. I guess what MTV had, which was, it was in everybody's house, and it's like, oh, hey, there's a new Great White album. I didn't know that. Right. But I don't know. I mean, you're you're on Twitter. You have your own tr personal Twitter, at yeah. Mark Kendall underscore GW. And, uh, of course, there's at Great White Rocks. I have to keep track because they're all a little different. There's, like, at Great White Rocks. Uh, official Great White TV is the YouTube channel, and so there's a, uh, and officialgreatwhite.com. Right, so right. those are all the ways that you know. I mean, look when when I was in high school and you know I, all my favorite bands, I sure couldn't keep tabs on them. You know, I wasn't getting updates from the tour or from the recording studio. Right. So that's got to be kind of a nice advent. I mean, obviously the music industry is completely different than it used to be. But keeping in touch with fans is so much easier than it used to be, right? Yeah. I mean, when you learn your way around the internet, you can, uh, you know, keep in touch with the fans, um, get our music to the fans, and, you know, you, you, it's, it's not like it used to be, like you said. We're not on the radio every five minutes. We don't have the MTV, but with the YouTube, they can go see us anytime they want. You know, like you said, just type it in and Check it out and dig it, you know? Yeah, which is great. And it's it's nice to see that, you know, Great White is a band that is releasing new music because you have a lot of bands. I mean, Gene Simmons from KISS infamously said that uh, we don't see any reason to make new music because people don't want it. The guys from Aerosmith have said some kind of contradictory things about whether or not they'll ever do another album, maybe a song or two. And uh, talk about how you and the rest of the guys in the band feel about making new music if that's kind of an important part as an artist or it's it's important to us and you know i i just think that it's what fuels us it, it it's our motivation it what it's what keeps us uh you know keeps our energy at the level we like it to be um it's just a case of you know when we're creative it, it just gives us energy and eliminates the risk of us going through the motions or, you know, I, I've made the analogy before. It'd be like a painter going out selling the same painting every year. It's like, how boring would that be after a while when, when you, it'd be like you quit painting. And I, and I just, I can't let myself do that or else. Because when we go on stage, we're literally excited to be there and, I, I think the fans can read uh, that, you know? Yeah, and I mean, look, it, it's obviously a matter of, you know, what you need to do as a band. I mean, the biggest tour of last year and probably this year is the Guns N' Roses reunion tour. Right. And it's great. And they went back to all the same places they went last year. They're going again this year. And they're going to do, you know, a really long, like, three and a half hour set or whatever it is, which is great. But what do they do next year when you've seen all those songs a couple times now? It's like, are they going to be able to get together in a studio and make a new album? That's a great question. No one knows because they don't talk to anyone. But right. at some point, even a huge band like that, you know, look, Metallica has huge tours too. Eventually, if they stop putting out new albums, people will be like, I've kind of seen them like four times playing the same songs. Sure. You know, so I think it's great when bands do make new music, even though obviously it's well, obviously what the old model was, you 
did the tour to help promote the album and the album is where all the money came from and now it's like well there's a new album to kind of remind people you're around so that they go see you out on tour is that yeah. is that really the way it's kind of reversed in the last it is kind of so reversed yeah. it is kind of reversed now we we do albums so we can tour you know <laughs> before i was touring to support the album um but but like i said it, it's really you know our fans are really loyal i can tell you that i mean they're still in front of the stage we still play in front of big crowds and they love it when we come with new music and you know we took it a step further and went to a great producer in nashville and and uh you know came with something that you know it, it really has us excited and the feedback has been pretty generous from from the journalists you know who aren't like our family members you know so i mean it's how they feel so you know we're thrilled with that and the way it came out and like i said it, it helps our helps us vibrate at a higher frequency when we can continue to get creative because that's when i'm the most excited and i just can't wait to go play it live you know so yeah, and by the way, the new album we're talking about is called Full Circle. It's been out for a few months now. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about playing some of the songs live. Uh, you know, on yeah. a typical set, you know, where you guys are the headliner, not not a festival set where maybe you're playing for a little bit less. Uh, how many songs do you think you put in from this album? Uh, just Well, it, it's not just this album. It's all albums. And we come with the new album. We usually put, you know, two Right. We've never bombarded anybody with a bunch of new music. You know. No, because you'll you'll hear about bands that there's two ways to do it. I think yeah. you guys are right in the middle, and that's the smart way to do it, where you get a couple of them like, oh, hey, we have a new album. Check this out. And then you have the bands that are like, oh, no, we're not going to play any of that stuff because they came to see the greatest hits. We don't want people to fall asleep. Yeah. And then you have the bands that are like, oh, we don't care. We're going to, you know, I think, uh, you know, obviously a band on the level of Iron Maiden can do this, but they played like mostly their new album on the tour because they're like, well, you people mm. come out and see us. But I think some kind of mix is what people really want. You know, the example that I always think of is a lifetime ago, I saw the Steve Miller Band open up and they did basically that Steve Miller Band greatest hits cassette, because that's my mentality. It was a cassette that everybody had. And they did all those songs plus one new one right in the middle. And that was it. And I'm like, yeah, that's what you should do. Sure. Play all the songs everybody wants, but give a taste of something new. And they were an opening band in that case. And I think it's great. So you also had an album in 2012, Relation. So mm -hmm. it's not like you basically just play stuff from 25 years ago, a couple right. new songs, and that's it. You kind of span the whole career when you guys play live? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we give everything that everybody wants to hear. But we just, just to keep us excited yeah we like to add a couple new ones you know we have extended jams so it's not like we're going through the motions with the stuff from the catalog and yeah. the back in the day or whatever we, and some of the jams we don't know what's going to happen so that you know creates a level of excitement for us that we really don't know is how we're feeling at the moment is it, you know we're bringing the crowd in they're going a little more crazy than normal so let's keep it going and, yeah you know milk it and and that way we're not it, it anything that eliminates the risk of us going through the motions we try to do that yeah because i know as just a, a fan when i see a band and then i might see them on the same tour whether it's a couple weeks later or a couple months later mm -hmm. and i see the same set list i'm like oh that's disappointing i wanted to mix it up so i can only imagine for the band it's like well we're going to do 100 dates and we're going to play the same 17 songs in the same order every night and then we get off the stage so it's got to be great to be able to mix it up and of course when you get new yes. songs in there and and the thing is with today with the modern technology it's it's not like back in the day we were touring and doing that a lot of bands say the same thing every night i mean it, it, it's kind of scripted with their raps in between songs but now that it's on the internet two minutes after you're off stage i mean your whole show's on the internet on cell phones so yeah that's true i mean and if they see that over and over it, it's a little you know it's it's a little different when you know when you're when you're looking at it from that view but um we don't mind the cell phones i i you know i've heard bands complain about them um yeah it's a, it's a different genre of music but yeah. uh sort of a, a band that i like more from more from like my college years is this band called the afghan wigs and what mm -hmm. they do uh, the singer greg julie is very particular about this they actually have the lights turned down mm -hmm. and it's terrible if you're sitting in the back, but uh, they just so that way you don't get a good picture. So the idea is like, well, you know, let's not take pictures. And 
I, I understand the distracting you know, the distractions of it. I like to take a couple pictures because I'm like, oh, I was at the show. Let me get a, especially if I'm close. I'm yeah. like, let me take a couple pictures. But then I, I, I also like to put my phone away and actually watch. I don't even mind the pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, I was more talking about the recording. Oh, sure. O only because of the quality. It's really has nothing to do with, with what's sonically happening that night. Yeah, and, and plus, if you guys decide, like, oh, here's, like, a, a song we all like. It's a cover song. Let's play around and try and do that, and then it doesn't go well. Well, then all of a sudden it's like, you know, Great White sucks doing a cover of, you know, pick pick a song. And oh. then it, it's out there, and even if it sounded great, well, if I recorded it on this iPad I'm holding right now, it would look and sound terrible. That's, that's the other way to look at it. I mean, if something bad does happen at a show... You know, somebody falls, or you know, there's yeah. any, any kind of thing like that. Well, then they're going to sell it's gonna TMZ. Get more, yeah, it's going <laughs> to get more hits than you can imagine. Yeah. But <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, the album we're talking about, the new album we're talking about, is called Full Circle, and uh, we'll get to, into some of the specifics in a little bit. Uh, I was kind of wondering about how hard it is for even a band with Great White's history that you have new music, but as we kind of talked about with putting the video out there, how hard is it to actually? have the music be heard? Um, well, we just hired a big team of, you know, like internet assassins, and they do pretty good at getting it, you know, social networking, getting it everywhere where, you know, people might hear it. Um, you know, we still have a, a really good fan base. I mean, you know, we've sold millions of records. we got tons of fans. Um, and like I said, they always show up at the show, so... Yeah, we just do the best we can. We we're more concerned about people hearing it than making money from it. You, oh you know? yeah, I mean, I'd I'd rather just I just like the feedback. You know, it sucks. It's great. Uh, mm -hmm. I really like the way it sounds or whatever. I just love that. Yeah, I, I when I was preparing, I was actually listening to a, a different interview that you did to make sure I didn't you know steal all the notes. But one of the things you mentioned is that it's great to actually listen to it physically as an album like put the cd in or whatever yeah. the preferred method is uh because i got them from a publicist it was nine individual tracks that i had right. to click on and so i sat there and i listened to it a couple times but each time the song ended and it didn't move on to the next one right so that really breaks it up and i was like these songs are great but it's like i, I couldn't take it in the car you know and, yeah. and there's probably a way to do it maybe i'm not i'll get you a copy oh, because that's, listening i wasn't, to I wasn't from, trying to get it no i know free, but but I, I know what you mean when you're listening track to track yeah that that's the optimum, you know, um, way to listen. You, you got to wait for a commercial, and you know the five yeah. second. Thing. Yeah, I mean, sometimes on YouTube there'll be a commercial in the middle of a song too, so you're just <laughs> like, oh, well, that that's my favorite part of the song. Um, I'm just sort of wondering if it's if it's a little bit frustrating to be releasing new music, and there are actually outlets out there that still play Great White's music. Uh, namely, there are a couple of uh, hard rock theme channels on Sirius XM, but they don't play new music. So they'll mm -hmm. play, you know, Once Bitten, Twice Shy, like, you know, eight times right. a day, a little bit of House of Broken Love, you know, every once in a while, they'll mix it up, but they don't play new music. Is, is it great that people remember the old stuff, but would it be better if it's like, you know, you know, maybe seven times once bitten twice shy and then sneak in something like big time they actually do play it on satellite radio the, some of the new stuff but um yeah i mean we're we're completely uh, feel blessed about our whole catalog sure, and all absolutely. the hits and all that because that that's just a big part of our history and we still love to play the stuff live you know and because it's a different audience every night and you know you don't know what's going to happen but um so all that's fine um so no i, I was just yeah I, and i guess it makes sense the, the channel in particular i was thinking of is there's the channel in series called hair nation now right. i know some people kind of bridle at that terminology you know hair band and things like that i think the term when it started getting thrown around was definitely derogatory but then some people say like oh i like those hair bands they don't mean it that way right but how does a band like yours that's still going long after that and maybe in some cases some of you don't have any hair to be a hair band anymore <laughs> i won't name anyone but uh do you what do you feel about being lumped together with those other bands because there's a lot of great bands that are considered hair bands it's it's fine with me mm -hmm. um because we all did have big hair and you know there was a couple of clothes makers that made uh, one guy in particular that made clothes for all of us and Juice Priest, <laughs> Motley Crue, yeah. us, uh, Rat. So um, 
when you're talking about the fashion, I totally get it. But yeah. I, I made the the uh, comment before. My hair never wrote a song, so <laughs> it's not. I don't know how. I mean, I play the way I do because of my influences. You know, guitar players. Sure. And, and and people more blues rock guys and stuff like that but um so really the hair i guess it's kind of an easy escape for a journalist just to call the whole 80s just the whole decade hair metal yeah because usually i mean i guess it depends on where it's coming from you know mm -hmm. if if rolling stone magazine or rollingstone.com because it's not really a magazine anymore mm -hmm. is compiling something about hair bands it's probably like oh we hate all these bands and we don't like their music because we're rolling stone and you know we only mm -hmm. like Radiohead. they're just hair metal yeah right exactly so yeah. that, that, that's kind of it's it's uh, very dismissive but I don't know. I mean, personally, I like that there's that channel, and and it's like it would be great if there was the new music on it. But uh, the fact that it, it's the old songs, it's very comforting, especially if I'm doing you know driving like five hours to Vegas and like right. well yeah, just the whole drive there, I can just you know get thrown a, a bunch of different songs. Uh, now your last ash album was called Elation. That was in 2012. So five years between albums. Look for a lot of people who don't make new yeah. albums anymore. That's actually not that long. But what happens for you and the band in those five years? Are you do you talk about like music a little bit like oh you know i have some ideas but you just don't actually get in the studio or do you not start compiling that's ideas? exactly what happened okay. we we wrote a bunch of songs a bunch of times because we wanted to do a record right and then we'd get busy doing so many shows and then nobody talked about it for a while and then you know uh, i don't know what kept it we didn't even use any of the ideas that we wrote in the past everything was fresh and new on this album but um it, it really happened by accident you know um i just ran into michael wagner on a monsters of rock cruise and right. accidentally he he just happened to say why don't we do something again and that kind of just sparked us all you know that when he said that because it was not even a thought about doing record at the time but we had talked about it for the whole five years. I mean, we were talking about it off and on. Like, we've got to do a new album. We've got to. Yeah. So this just allowed us to remember that. And we <laughs> go, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So. Well, and you're talking about Michael Wagner, the producer. So yeah. uh, he did. Did he do Great Whites, the, the first EP? or Because the, the first album is a collection of a few EPs, right? So he did. the. No, we did one EP. Right. Our very first one. Okay. Got a little airplay in L.A., you know with no deal or anything but sure. we were heavy rotation which allowed us to get a major label deal and he did our first album as well oh, okay so he did the album and the first ep yeah. all right i that that makes sense and so at that point when it was just an ep what is that you just have like a five like songs a, five songs on a cassette that you're selling five after songs shows? on a record on the on same, record the oh. same songs on both sides oh we'll see that <laughs> and and cassette as well same yeah. songs on both sides oh that's so great that's and, what we and did so what year is that or roughly 1982 1982 okay yeah. so there, there was still a pretty long road ahead for uh success oh, yeah. um so you work with michael wagner again and he's produced some of my favorite albums of the past 30 years so i want to give him uh some credit for in addition to the first great white album he did <laughs> uh alice cooper's two heaviest albums he ever did and for those watching on youtube i do have an alice cooper shirt on so he did these two <laughs> albums called constrictor and raise your fist and yell which is like 86 87 right you know he let's just say he went away for a little while mm -hmm. he came back he was uh, a lot cleaner he was finally sober for real and he so he did uh, he produced those albums uh, extremes porno graffiti which a lot of people know because it has more than words on it but that's actually like a really heavy record yeah in addition you know except totally. for that song uh skid row slave to the grind and so many more so he has a great track record but Aussie, you guys Metallica, right uh, I mean, except and yeah, yeah much yeah. heavier bands and so you guys worked with him what is that 35 years ago but i assume you must have kept in touch to some extent you just hadn't worked with him since then i was a fan sure. i followed his career you know i i'm not a downloader like i go get cds and stuff and yeah. uh, and read the liner notes and you yeah know, i see oh god he produced another one or he, you know oh my god this guy's just like constantly working so um and i always loved his productions um and it was just kind of time for us to to get away from what we're used to and just go to a different environment. And, you know, Nashville is just awesome anyways. Um, and just to be in a different studio and, you know, working with this iconic producer, 
It was yeah, just a now, great situation. Before we started, you were talking a little bit about his studio. So talk yeah. about his studio in Nashville and just, you know, obviously a guy's been producing as long as he has. Right. He's going to make sure that he has a studio that has everything that he wants in it, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. It, it's in the woods, for one thing. There's like deer all around his house and stuff. And this is, this, just, so this is like outside of Nashville? Yeah, a ways? He just, yeah. it's way away from the city. And he just built this huge studio. Um, you walk in, it's just like you're blinded by all these platinum records everywhere. And, um, you know, uh, in his studio, I mean, it's just like so much outboard gear. It's just confusing. I, I don't, I'm not technical, so. <laughs> um, but just a beautiful studio, you know, and a great room where he did the drums with like an obscene amount of mics. I mean, I think it was like 26 mics. Wow. And, it, you know, the way he works is so awesome. And it's different than the way we've done it in the past, which is he does one song at a time. I mean, we record all the drums and bass, bass guitar. Okay. And then once that's done, we pl we just do one song until it's completely finished. When we went there, we didn't have all the lyrics done. And he's not used to working like that. So, you know, we just go kind of compromise with this, please, and we're sorry, you know, or whatever. Because we, we spent 10 days writing this record um, when we knew we had to be there. We really kind of crunched it. But um, so knowing that we're going to work on the song the following day, it allowed us to work on the lyrics for that song and finish it. We had choruses. We had scatting little parts yeah. done, but not complete. And... Um, so he kind of worked on the fly, which is not the way he normally works. He normally goes out, sees a band, works with them in rehearsal for a week. They make a demo. He, you know, um, works on the songs for like two months. Yeah. And then they come in and know every note they're going to play and stuff. That wasn't the case with the way we did it. Well, the end result was, uh, Great. of course, the yeah, the yeah. record, uh, f Full Circle is the name of it, and uh, we heard the song big time. Uh, there's a couple of other uh, songs, uh, one called Give It Up, that might be my favorite, has a little funky bass heavy, or no, sorry, there's a little funky opening there, which I yeah. liked. Uh, a couple of other uh, great songs, the one, my notes are a little disjointed, that's my fault. Uh, <laughs> Cry of a Nation was the one with the really heavy bass, and yeah. of course, you know, you should always have like a, a nice acoustic song called Let Me In, and there's another one called This Is The Life. Uh, so uh, there's nine songs in total, which is it's sort of like an, an old school sort of record in that way. Because, yeah. you know, a lot of the greatest records that you can think of have nine, ten songs on it. And now, of course, you could put out an album with 17, 18 songs. But I yeah, kind of sure. like the idea of the sort of old feeling that it's like, yeah, it's going to be, these yeah. are our best songs. Sure, there's some other songs. I, I'm sure you have other songs you could have put on there. Yeah. But uh, these were the best ones. And right. uh, I, I think... The end result is great, and uh, one of the things that you were saying about the studio before we started, though, uh, talk about what he did with the concrete, which sounded like such a crazy thing to do. It was like he raised it up just for the... Uh... Well, uh, you know, he's probably been in so many studios yeah. in his career. When he built his own, you know, he really thought everything out. Um, so when you're in the, the lounge area, which is off the studio, and then there's a kitchen... When people are watching TV and everything, he separated the concrete and the ground and also separated the ceiling. Yeah. So it's literally two different rooms that looks like a room that goes into another room, like in your house. Right. But it's so separate that you can't hear any music at all when those two doors are oh, shut. Wow. It's dead silent. Um, so things like that, when he built it... Um, you know, he had the rooms tuned perfect, so the music sounds real good in his mm -hmm. in his studio. When you're listening back, you can hear everything. You know, it's it's a nice sound. So, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's a good feeling when you when you go work with somebody like him, knowing in advance that it's going to be sonically awesome. Yeah, you, you know, it just gives you confidence, and he gave me confidence with his personality. He's a, a super guy to be around. He makes you feel comfortable. And that's another, I think, part of his professionalism. But it comes natural, I believe. Yeah. And, and of course, the interesting thing is, 
you know, sure, it was outside of the city, but this is in Nashville. And, you know, everybody knows Nashville's mm-hmm. music city. I'm using air quotes. Yeah. But let's be honest, when you hear music city, you think of country music. But at some point in the last few years, it's kind of become this epicenter for hard rock. Not long ago, I interviewed Mark Slaughter, and it was via Skype. He right. was in Nashville because he lives there. So many guys live there now. Right. What is it about Nashville that just everybody seems to grab it? I know you guys don't live there, but you recorded right. your album there. What is it? about Nashville and hard rock that's happened in the last few years, as it, far as you can tell. It's away from the traffic. It's away from kind of mayhemish living like in L.A. or whatever. Sure. It, it's kind of more laid back. I think a lot of musicians go there. And, and also, uh, you, you can get a lot for your money home-wise. Um, you know, you can get what would cost $10 million here, maybe for... 800,000 there. Yeah. I mean, That's a good point. And like yeah. full, like five acre front yards. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, and, and deer, I mean, the vibes there, you know, ducks coming up out of the lakes and, you know, um, so I, it, there's not a lot of distractions. If you're a musician and you just want to focus on music and not kind of the mayhem of the streets and craziness, it, it's a good place for that. Um, yeah, I imagine the album would have sounded a lot different if you guys had all recorded in L.A. and, you know, you'd spent like an hour and a half on the 405 and bumper to bumper traffic, I, then got in the studio. Hey, let's be creative. You I know? don't. I, I, I've been through that. I've sure. done it that way. And, you know, you're, you, you roll out of bed, you take a shower and you just can't wait to play. You're excited. And by the time you get there, you're just burnt from driving <laughs> and, yeah. you know, angry because of all the bad drivers. That that's one thing great about it, and we actually had a couple moments where we at the end just to have fun. We got some people down to do gang shouts and just like one word things and stuff oh, like cool. that. And uh, they were all in huge bands. <laughs> they all lived, you know, with friends of Wagner's. I mean, guys from like Pat Travers and Mark Slaughter, like you mentioned him, and he was there, and just you know, this gal from Izzy for or Lizzie from Hellstorm. Oh, sure, yeah, Lizzie um, Hell, yeah. Uh, guys from Skid Row. I mean, it was great. Just, just a ton of people, and um, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, we were talking about the physical CD version of Full right. Circle, and I guess I don't know if it's the average edition or if it's a special edition, but there is an edition that has a DVD, right. and it's called Making a Full Circle. Uh, talk Correct. about having cameras around, and if that was obtrusive, or if it's the kind of thing after the first couple hours you get used to it or if maybe things happen a little differently because there was a camera in the corner? Well, for one thing, I knew this was going to be really special, and if we had to use our cell phones, I was going to do that, but I happened to uh, get a hold of a company that, uh, actually people I knew from the past, um, and one guy taught at a film school and had all this gear and stuff, and he said he would come down and film. So I just wanted to document the whole process and I had got the idea from Deep Purple yeah, about eight years ago. I was watching the making of Machine Head. Which oh, sure, that, yeah. That album. Yeah. And, you know, but it was done like 20 plus years after the facts, but it was still awesome. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Deep Purple. And they just gave every detail on how they recorded the bass player is like pushing up faders of Blackmore parts. And he goes, listen to a machine like that is. And <laughs> I'm just like, in heaven, to look at that. And, so when we had this opportunity to work with this icon, uh, Michael Wagner, I, I'm going. I want. The, I want this stuff on film for yeah, later. Sure. And and you guys had never done that any of your past never. albums. Well, we okay. don't even allow people in the studio oh, okay. when we record. I mean, you know, and if they do come in, we're not playing until they right, leave, sure. type thing. So we've always been, I don't know, secretive or private or whatever you want to call it. But um, this is what I, I decided to be great for the you know to do this for the fans for like an extra you know i mean they edited it down everybody does interviews there's arguments so we just left everything in and you can watch us i mean we're literally writing lyrics on tape oh that's fantastic but after a while you don't even realize they're there because it they rolled for the whole two months so i couldn't believe some of the stuff that was still uh, i didn't even know they were filming because i'm not paying attention (laughs) and and so it, it turned out great and um yeah, so that that's fun to have that. I, I want it for me. I mean, yeah. just so I can always have right, it. Right, even if it was never released, you'd yeah. be glad that you have it. I would be glad it, to right? have it for my kids to sure. look at or whatever, you know. Yeah. 
So well, and then so that DVD is called the Making of Full Circle. Right. And if you buy the CD of Full Circle, uh, that's how you'll get it. Uh, yeah, of course, it's a two disc set. So okay. so you know if you buy the physical product from our website, uh, official officialgreatwhite dot com. Yes. Yes. Uh, you can get the that now. If you want to download it, it's on all the download platforms for music yeah i think a lot yeah. of people kind of prefer that i mean i like we were talking about i like to get the cd because then you can just you know plug it in your computer and then it's on your phone you know yeah. instead of just you know i like i don't know i like some of my favorite albums have great album artwork and then i you know sometimes you want to know like sure. who some of the guest people are you know the guest musicians uh, on the album and you're not going to necessarily i mean you can google it but it's great if you can just flip through something while you listen right. and you know usually <laughs> in when the albums would come with lyrics i wouldn't sit down and read them the first time but then you start to get a song in your head and it's like well, what is that line that's stuck in my head you might not yeah. understand yeah. right yeah, exactly absolutely. so that that's always great and again yeah. the new album full circle and you can get it, uh, it has all those lyrics ways. in it as well oh great officialgreatwhite.com and mm -hmm. as i said before they're on Twitter at Great White Rocks. The YouTube channel is official Great White. And let's throw in the personal plug. Mark Kendall underscore GW. And that's because of because of Great White, not because you're a huge admirer of George Washington, but maybe, <laughs> maybe it's because of that too. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your background and your uh, influences. We were talking mm -hmm. uh, before the show, you grew up sure. uh, not too far south from here in Huntington Beach, California, um, but you grew up as part of a very musically talented family. So talk yeah. a little bit about the household. Your mother was a jazz singer and your dad played the trumpet. Is that correct? My dad was a trumpet player yeah. in bands. Um, my mom, sang mm -hmm. uh, she, she wasn't never made a record or anything like oh, that but she used to sing in his when they took a break she oh, would go okay. up with a piano player and sing for a half hour or whatever oh, and then they'd great. come back and play the set but um yeah so my dad was you know my, my whole family's pretty musical as far as my dad my mother my grandpa was a touring piano player with the show girls you know like mm -hmm. the you know and he just really played ragtime, and I used to make him play every time I went over there. But um, how I got into music was just listening to it because it was always going in the house, and I used to listen. And they would have songs like, um, you know, a lot of jazz, but they had something like Girl from Ipanema. That's one oh, that sure, always yeah. stuck out. <laughs> and I loved the melody. I would just listen to singers. Um, even when I started playing guitar at nine because of neighbors had a band in their garage, and I made my dad get me a guitar he got me an acoustic kind of learned some chords but um he got me my first three albums were cream jimmy hendrix and the doors and when i listened to those songs because of listening to the music i only listened to the singer that's all i heard when i heard those albums even at that age but then as i grew older i started listening more to the guitar and going holy crap man and you know. those are three great albums. I, I saw in the notes, so I guess it was uh, Are You Experienced was the Hendrix album, right. Israeli Gears was the Cream album, and Correct. Strange Days by the Doors. It, it, so that's it. Uh, those are all great albums, and they're such distinct, very unique sounding albums. Those yeah. albums, do, you know, that would not totally. make, you know, the old days we used to make mixtapes. Those wouldn't make a great mixtape to go from one song back to the other. You know, it's kind of like, let's listen to that straight through and you then flip the side it. over and Absolutely. listen to Strange Days. And so that really, just in those three albums, you must have been exposed to so many different just sounds like, oh, instruments can make that noise. I can tell you, I was so blown away by like the doors. When I listened to that album, it like took me somewhere different than where I yeah. was. I mean, I, I felt things. I thought of things. Um, well, that seems they, fitting considering they were like that like, alien to me. Yeah, considering so that outrageous. the guys in the doors weren't actually mentally in the studio when they recorded the album, it probably is good to be transported somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the music actually did that for me. Yeah, uh, um, you know, the sake of sounding corny, I, I really did feel things when I listened to that. It was so awesome. Um, but that just made me want to play. And, you know, as time went on, I got started listening to guitar. You know, got into Santana for a long time. I got into Johnny Winter, Alvin Lee, Billy Gibbons. I mean, you know, just went on and on. Everybody to me was so great. It was, like, mind-blowing. And, and even on a local level, I was pretty floored by some of the guitar Were any players. of the local guitarists people who went on to a bigger success? Or there was just yeah. more... Absolutely, like Van Halen. Right, of course. Uh, yeah, they used to like play in backyards in yeah, Pasadena. Yeah, I saw him like when I was sixteen for the first time in a in a junkyard in uh, El Monte. <laughs> I wow. lived in El Monte at that time, and I um, 
went and saw him because my buddy had seen him twice and right i walked to it it was like three blocks uh, you know, paid one dollar to get in. They had like four kegs of beer. <laughs> the singer was blowing a tube inside of the floor tom to make the pitch go up and down. Oh wow! Yeah, and that's the first thing I saw, and I go, okay, let's get this guitar thing going. And uh, he played. He, he wasn't doing the eruption stuff, right. or, or he didn't have a wing bar then. But his style, you could tell. He still played really fast. Yeah, for, well, yeah. he played different. Mm -hmm. You know, to where he got my full attention, and I started following around just like a little fan. I mean, just like kind of blown away by them. Yeah, and just just think, you saw Van Halen for a dollar, and just imagine, even if you saw them today, just how many dollars it would actually cost to see Van Halen. <laughs> well, I, they went up to two dollars at one point. And oh like, my! Oh my God! Two dollars. <laughs> Forget it. We'll, we'll go yeah. find another band that's a yeah, dollar. Exactly. Let's go to the dollar band. <laughs> uh, so you know, you're influenced probably little bits here and there by all these different guitarists. Yes. Do you just when you'd sit there and play guitar, you would just kind of would you be like, oh, I like this bit of this song, and then you go into. I learn just, it you just learn i the would whole learn song. it all that's great I, I, I would learn it and you know i've met most of my heroes and, and it's it's difficult you know i get a little nervous and but i'm trying to explain to billy gibbons just as he's sitting as far as you are away and, and how important he was to yeah. me and like what the music did for me it's like i know exactly what i was doing when all these songs came out and and he got it he he was one guy that was very down to earth soulful gave me his full attention and um so that was sweet, and and actually kept in touch with me like uh, by email. Oh, I was wow. like blown away. It's like he goes, "Yeah, if we're ever in town, you know, come on down, have mercy, bring the family." You know, <laughs> I was like, I'm shocked. Uh, th that's one thing I noticed. It's like every time you meet the icon hero status dude, he's always down to earth, soulful greatest guy ever yeah it's usually like the the new kid on the block who has the album you're like oh that's interesting or he's want... or the guy who thinks he's supposed to be where <laughs> billy gibbs is that guy yeah. might be a little you know <laughs> yeah. testy you know but um uh one of the yeah. interesting things i read when i was reading up on you is that you know obviously you were playing guitar in high school and you were of course uh, getting very good at it but you were also a great baseball pitcher and uh at one point did you have sort of were you ever torn at all like when you know before you would have hurt yourself were you like oh i don't know do i want to be hendrix or do i want to be you know don drysdale or you know or were you ever torn between guitar and baseball or was it something that there was able to balance easily a little bit uh, um i always loved music and i always went back to it no matter what but i you know i was trying to do both i was just a little uh disheartened by the talent at 18, even on my own team, there, mm -hmm. there was guys on my own team that were better. And I noticed when guys got scouted, it was like one guy and he was getting write-ups like every week in papers, right. you know, because he hit so many home runs or did some outlandish stuff that actually got the attention of a scout. I just felt like, you know, I talked to Joe Rogan about this and he said, well, what would you think if you worked harder at it, you know, like maybe worked out with some light weights and, mm -hmm. you know, got yourself in shape and ate health food and all that, you know. But people and weren't really it, doing that back I then, I might have right? done, yeah. no. Yeah, nobody, no, no baseball player was I'll, lifting I'll tell you, the point. difference between then and now is the managers and coaches would just go, go play. Yeah. You know, and the natural, talented guy stood above everybody else. To where today they have video, they have pro camps, pros coming to these guys. 12 year olds look like little pros i mean they're, and they they're, have they have pitch counts for 12 year olds and, oh yeah, yeah. and, and their their mechanics and, and their fundamentals are perfect you yeah. know they have drills they're you know we didn't have any of that we just you know got up there and, and swing and hope for the best you know <laughs> which sounds a lot more fun you know to not have the pressure of hey you know you could make a career out of this it's more yeah. like hey go have fun and play baseball with with your friends and hey if you're good at it it's a lot more fun sure and i guess music is the same way so uh, I think I read this correctly. So it, it started hurting your hand to pitch, so you stopped my playing arm, baseball. Your my arm, arm was okay. hurting. I was throwing curveballs at 11 years old that wow. broke like four feet. I mean, and that my dad and my coach, everybody kept telling me. My dad was my coach every year or, or manager, and they were telling me, you know, ease up, throw more fastballs. You're gonna, th you're gonna throw your elbow out or something. Right. <laughs> and I never had a problem with curves. It was from fastballs. I threw my arm out. Like literally right now, if I grab a football and throw it as hard as I can, I'll feel it in oh, the wow. same spot. 
and um, but and I guess so for guitar playing, you're using completely different muscles entirely. So yeah, it's, like, it's yeah, a pick it's just, in your right, fingers, yeah. you know. So yeah, that's never affected anything like that. But throwing a ball, I still feel it. I I don't know what happened, but um, so I was literally signaling my dad to take me out after like three innings. Oh wow! Instead of him coming out and going, "How yeah. you feeling?" and all that, I would go, "Dad, I'm <laughs> done. Over. Put me on first. You know. Yeah. So like, I I just felt like. Um, I love music, like I said, and, you know, to make it all the way when you're like third or fourth best on your t own team, it was just, yeah. it, it wasn't going to happen. Um, even though my dad said only one in a million make it music and this and that, it, it was way better chance than I had at that. Please. I was going to say, I think that the, the odds of baseball are, are not really that much better. I mean, especially, I mean, sure, now there's 30 teams, you know, so yeah. there's that many players that they need. But, you know, I mean, at that point, how many jobs in Major League Baseball were there really? You know? Not so, many. And, yeah. and I can tell you this, even if you get signed, you might never get past, like, you know, single A even, yeah. or double A. You know, um, it's once again, it's another level, but you're still not a major leaguer. Now you have to blow away all these dudes that are awesome. Yeah. You know, and then you might go up to AAA maybe. A lot of people play their whole career in, in the minors. Yeah. And you, you and make know, a decent living. They you, make, you, you, have, you have those guys who have the whole minor league career and sort of, you know, they're they're in the same organization, so usually they get a couple at bats so that they can get a pension, and the, you know. The, yeah. it's, but it's it's a whole but, thing. Uh, here's another th uh, factor: it, say a guy does get called up into the yeah. majors, how good does he play under the heat of that? Yeah. Knowing that if he chokes, he, he's losing out on like maybe fifty million a year, you know, possibly. I mean, you know, so how, that's how you can judge a great player a guy that can play under tons of pressure you know yeah, and, and, and still, still does deliver. well yeah like you know there there's a lot of differences between somebody like Clayton Kershaw who comes up and everybody's like oh you're going to be great and he actually is great right. uh, i'm i'm a fan of the mets and they have all these great pitchers yeah. that some of them are actually as good as they're supposed to be and then some of them aren't right. and you can see a guy like Matt Harvey it just weighs on him so much he's like i have good stuff I'm supposed to be great. I'm not great. I don't know what it Under is. Under the and pressure it, situation. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's just, they get so frustrated. And obviously, you know, it seems, I don't know, it seems so tough to have to deal with all yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, to be able to bring your practice game yeah. to a real situation, that's a tough transition. To, yeah. um, to have all this pressure, you have to get this guy out, or you got to get a hit, or we're going to yeah. lose the series, or whatever. You know, to be able to perform under that, it, it takes a... A right, but art. of course, transitioning it back to music, there's still a lot of pressure to try nope. and perform and deliver yeah. and be able to make it. Uh, as I was reading up on you, I saw that uh, one of your earliest bands was called a Zizix, Z-Z-Y-Z-X, yes. <laughs> which might not mean much to a lot of people in other parts of the country, but for anybody who's driven to Vegas, there's this exit that's called Zizix Road, and you see right. it, and you're like... That's the craziest thing I've ever seen. I don't want to exit there. I don't want to know no. what's happening over there. Uh, but uh, I just thought it was so. That has to be where the name came from. Was just yeah. seeing that. Yeah. Because it's like because if not, it was just either it was like a typo somewhere that it was meant to be called something else. <laughs> yeah. Um, talk a little bit about sort of you know the, obviously the different permutations of the bands that were put together that ultimately became Great White. You talked about the first album. It didn't really perform that well though. So kind of give the kind of Reader's Digest version if people even know what Reader's Digest. Starting is at the first. Album, yeah, just sort of putting it together, putting the band together, and how the first album wasn't as well received. Well, um, you mentioned Zizix, um, that's where Jack Russell, our original singer, sure. um, auditioned for that band, and he just didn't like the other guys, but he liked me. Um, I showed him a couple originals, he goes, Let's make our own band. I said, I'm totally over this band, I'm, I'm on board, let's do it. Um, and then he went through through some things and got in some troubles and for a couple of years and so I had a couple other singers and then he got out of his trouble came auditioned again for another band that I had and and that band although a couple members went in and out by the time we got a record deal um the bass player had only been in the band three weeks wow. <laughs> you know so he just lucked out because yeah. this other guy left because he he told me that we were not heavy enough. Um, so whatever. Which is uh, funny because the band was probably much heavier at that We point. were. Yeah. So you can imagine what he wanted to do. <laughs> he, he made a band, you know, he, 
he he was he had cheese graters on his base and he used to like <laughs> he was in Aussie for a month and was too outrageous for them even. So I mean he he used to grind his knuckles and really bleed like he got hepatitis twice. Oh my God. So I'm never That's, going to be too uh, heavy enough for that guy. Like, yeah, I was going to say, most people aren't as metal as that guy was. That no, guy was a little too metal. He was way metal. <laughs> he was way metal. But the guys in Motley Crue and guys, you know, when we were up and coming, they'd go just to check him out because see what he'd do next, <laughs> you know. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, we we were just playing a gig one night at the Whiskey and met a, a guy came backstage, gave us his card, and he happened to be an A&R guy for an independent label. And we went down and saw him. He's, and at that time, we were called Dante Fox. We, we moved on from the Zizix thing. And we were Dante Fox. He liked er, pretty much everything except for the name. Right. And I guess he had seen me drive by the building. He was out, and there was all these kids there. He was, I guess, waiting for his car or something. And I stuck my head out the window and screamed something, and he said, the kid next to him said, there goes Great White. <laughs> and uh, Because Jack, the singer, used to call me that. And oh. he he just said, "Oh, I oh this is cool." He goes, "That name I hate." Now I got the name, you know. So the next yeah. we went to the record company. He changed the name right there on the spot and uh, became our manager actually. And thing just kind of moved on from there. We we made that demo EP, generated interest, got dropped from that label, made another album on our own, got a marginal hit with Face the Day. Right. That generated the Capitol Records interest, and. You know, and from then on, from that album, you know, sold like two million or whatever, we had hits, you know, legitimate. But it wasn't, you know, it was just from writing a lot, we finally, our influences were coming out and we were able to uh, um, make music that people could identify with. Yeah, and obviously it's interesting because you know, look, there's a there's a few bands that you can sort of isolate that some of their best known songs happen to be cover songs. You know, for for your oh, band, yeah. it's Once Bitten, Twice Shy. Uh, one of my favorite bands is Tesla. For all their great hits, their best known song is probably Signs. You yeah. know, and it's just it's just interesting because mm -hmm. it's it, it's somebody else's song. But there's probably a lot of people that are just like, well, that's a great white song. They, I, I sure didn't know that when I first well, heard it. Yeah, I mean, our first big hit was obviously uh, Rock Me. Yeah. But then the following album, because of that album was called Once Bitten, yeah. this the follow-up was going to be Twice Shy, right? <laughs> so um, Izzy Stradlin from Guns N' Roses actually came to Alan with that song. They almost did it, supposedly. Oh, wow. And he goes, check this song out. You had an album called Once Bitten. This was going to be called Twice Shy. You got to hear the song. It's an Ian Hunter song. Never a hit, like in the States. Yeah, and Ian Hunter is somebody that's not as well-known in the States, I think. Right. Well, yeah. Martha Hoople was, right, but, but not his, his solo, solo career, stuff, yeah. which that was from his solo yeah. album. And we didn't even sing the same lyrics, and it was it was really a quite a coincidence. We borrowed it when we toured Jesus Priest in '84. Mm -hmm. Our sound man was really good friends with him, lived in New York, and he said he had this badass drum riser in his backyard. So we actually borrowed his drum riser <laughs> three or four or five years before we did that song. So um, he was completely out of the business, and when that song went so big, he got, made so much money oh, that he literally <laughs> put a band back together and was on MTV. He was touring, and people were asking him, why are you playing that great white song, man? <laughs> you know? So oh, that was pretty funny. funny. We kind of made it our own a little bit, and um, you know, uh, I think people related to the lyric, and the, and the hook was uh, Oh, really yeah, big. it's, I mean, you know, look, I talked about how my, my, my. Hair Nation plays it a bunch of times a day because it's such a great, catchy song. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so obviously we talked about MTV being such an important figure in that time period. You know, yeah. if MTV didn't like your video, it was going to be hard to sell records. But if they did... It, it, no, it wasn't that. It, it's... They're completely judging by where you are on the charts and how much airplay you get. Okay. It's completely that that goes right into how often they're going to play you. Oh, if I see. you got a massive hit and you're number one, they're going to play your vi that video more than anyone else, and, and that's just the, kind of the way it went. Right. So you turning in a good song with a good video, it doesn't matter. It actually right. has to still. We, chart that song as... went to number five. Right. Billboard. It was actually above Michael Jackson at one point. <laughs> I was like, what's going on here? And we were number one on TV for like three or four weeks with that song. Yeah. But it really had nothing to do with anything apart from 
by design because of where the song was, the popularity of the song that dictated, that made the video. It's not because it's the greatest video I ever made or anything. It's never one of those great. It, it's just that it got so much attention. Yeah. You, you know. Yeah, and uh, another sort of a fond memory for me in terms of the band, you know, I, I sort of grew up in a little bit more of a rural place. I didn't get out to see a lot of bands, uh, at least not when I was younger. So when Grey White was on MTV Unplugged, I was very excited because that was a great set that you guys had. I don't know how many songs you played versus how many were on TV. But one thing that always stuck with me was like this great cover of Babe, I'm Going to Leave You. Right. But in addition to that, and a song that's always kind of stuck with me and I'll still get in my head once more, you guys did this song, Wasted Rock Ranger, which I know is on one of the albums. Right. Uh, talk about that song, because it's, it's such a weird song in my mind, but it's... That was another song that um, some, I believe Izzy again, had a, some buddy that wrote that song, and we thought it was the funniest thing on earth. So like, so we used Izzy, to do Izzy's, it. Like, Izzy's like the ghost producer yeah, no, for, for Great and, White. And that's just total coincidence. It happened. That's, that's so the uh, the second thing that happened. But yeah, um, Izzy was very close to Alan Niven, so uh, he was around more than kind of the other guys were. So um, that just happened to be two things that happened like that. Uh, anyway, it's such a it's such a like a random. I don't know. I mean, it's a great song, but to me, it's a silly song, and that it, 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 it stood out. It's to making me because fun it was, of drugs. And, yeah, and, right. You know. Exactly, and I think that was. But you know, not to undercut the great cover, babe. I'm going to leave you, but that was the one that always stuck with me because I'm like, I like this. The, well, let me tell you song. something about that. Um, Alan called me the night before we were going to do the unplugged, and, and um, actually, it was the first show ever, and. They had the damn Yankees and Don Henley on the same day. We all recorded on the oh, same wow, day. Okay. And he goes, I want you to learn a Led Zeppelin song. And I go, tonight? Like, tonight? <laughs> like and now? He goes, yeah. And he goes, what is it? Babe, I'm going to leave you. I go, are you serious? We're not going to rehearse. I'm just going to all play and hope it works I out. hope it works, yeah. Yeah. And I go, there's all this picking. I go, this isn't like learning Tush or like yeah. Johnny Be Good or something. There's all this like flamingo, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but I learned it, and we rehearsed it in the dressing room a couple times and did one run-through with the band. I did not have that arrangement on totally in my head. I got lucky. I was very nervous, and I used to drink back then. I was sure. drinking beer, and I was like one beer shy of like the perfect mixture, so that was, <laughs> that was horrid. If you ever watch that video, my hand's shaking really bad. Oh, that's interesting. And when it gets to the end... I'm smiling. I'm all happy because I know it's, like we got I know it. it's over. <laughs> and then they put that in heavy rotation on MTV. It's oh, yeah, hysterical. because it's, it's, it's it promotes their show. Uh, it's funny. I didn't realize that was the same day. I remember the damn Yankees. There's like this funny, weird acoustic version of Cat Scratch Fever, which is not designed to be Nugent that was a crack up. He yeah. goes, yeah, w one time somebody gassed me and made me play an acoustic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you referenced it. So obviously a huge part of your life now is your sobriety. Uh, take a moment to talk about how long you've been sober and just the kind of immediately noticeable improvements it had in your life. Well, um, I first got sober in 91, actually, but um, I would go a couple of years and never really was fully committed. Right. You know, and I always wanted to drink like normal people. I was, you know, drinking. Like sit down, have a couple of I was beers. a beer guy. Yeah. I mean, just strictly beer. I didn't, didn't really drink hard alcohol, but I, I just drank beer like silly. And I, I could quit for two years, but it was all white knuckle sobriety, you know. I, I kept going back, trying to drink like regular people, and actually pull it off for maybe yeah. a week or so, but end up right in the same spot again, pain. And I just kept going like that until 2008. I just um, got serious and started listening, taking direction, and all that kind of stuff. And then six years ago i started reaching out on facebook just seeing if anybody's out there struggling i i was just offering my sober friendship right and just to be supportive you know not offering any miracles or anything like that just kind of share how i did it and what life's like now and stuff and uh I, so I have this like online group where I send these guys meditations and prayers every oh, day, cool. like 94 people. Mm -hmm. I've literally, I have literally seen some miracles, man. I'm telling you. Yeah, um, uh, I know. Uh, before uh, Terry Elu was the singer in Great White, I know you guys worked a little bit with Janie Lane, uh, yeah. formerly of Great White, and his sure. dependency problems were pretty well documented. Mm -hmm. And you were sober at this point, Correct. so were you able to sort of talk about those issues? Yeah, with him before I, I passed? actually worked with him on a daily basis, and he did ten shows with us, and he was stone cold sober. He had his wife out, 
He was looking good. He was taking care of himself. He was singing better than he had in 20 years, fans mm -hmm. were saying. And I'm like, dude, what's wrong with this, man? Yeah. It was like we were actually outside in an airport, and it was like this perfect sunlight, and he was sitting with his wife, and, you know, he, he just looked amazing. And I, I'm going, you're singing better than ever. You look better than ever. Your wife's, like, stunning and, and and the sun is shining i mean yeah. what what do you want i mean is, this yeah. isn't good enough or what yeah, what else no. what else do you need in what he to told this? me is that he wanted to be a sober man more than anything right which is when things stop is where he's the most trouble with the voices you know go ahead man go get a couple or whatever yeah. but um so he was the type drinker like me i'm a beer guy so not to put it low on the food chain because i drank a ton of it yeah but um, you know, he was a hard alcohol person that would drink until like he fell down and hit his head, or you know what yeah, I mean. Sure. So he's like just kind of a blackout drinker. But I kept in touch with him, and and he was really doing well. I was really shocked. When yeah, I, I think I, I, I'd sort of heard that from a, a few people who at least knew him that they were kind of surprised because things. I went to his like memorial they're... just okay. so I could speak, just mm -hmm. so I could let his family, his fans and everybody know that he did want to be sober yeah this wasn't like a personal thing this was a problem uh he, he just demons that overcame the man and so you know well you sort of talked a little bit about the personal demons in terms of how yeah. difficult it was for you to be sober talk about how i would imagine going out on tour with a rock band is not the best time to try and get sober i imagine right. for you that probably you know, you said you go a couple years, but that's yeah. a couple years of it always being around, it always being an option. Sure. And so eventually you're just going to crack at some point, I suppose. It was right? very difficult in the beginning, I can say that. I mean, just to go anywhere where somebody's drinking or, or you know, it's just so jealous of normal drinkers. It just it, it angered me that people could just drink like normal and, and not have a problem. Um, so I was a little jealous of that, and it was difficult the first few months, maybe first year even, and I just stuck with it. I really kept focused on the one day at a time thing, and now today I'm I'm more comfortable in my own skin. Like I can get in small groups of people and not be nervous about sure. it. Or, to where I used to use alcohol to be able to get in those situations, yeah. so I could be the cool guy, you know. <laughs> and I I would actually use alcohol so I could be relaxed and and you know, just groove with people, but because I'm, I was a very shy person, and now I'm, I'm more comfortable in my own skin today, and I have a, just my relationship is awesome, you know, with my wife, sure. and we had dark years, we call them the dark years, yeah. when I was drinking, and maybe she smoked pot, or, you know, it, it was just, we, our, our lives were in disarray, and it all stemmed from that, you know, just the way we treated each other, it's so much different today. And that's why I try to tell people um, what I've learned, which is it gets better. You know, don't get so frustrated in the beginning. It's going to get better. Just get through today. Put all your focus into today. And then um, it, it gives you less of a task. Right. You, it, because I hear newcomers coming in, they'll go, I'm done with this stuff, man. You know, I'm never going to drink again. Yeah. I go, man, you were putting a feet in front of your you know, just do it today, man. Don't worry about this forever. And yeah. you're done. You don't have to be done. I've been done 80 times probably. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, I you know, I referenced earlier that I was a big fan of Alice Cooper, who was legendary. You know, yeah. you drink a case of Budweiser a he day. He does very and, well. And, no. and, yeah, I mean, you know, he replaced it with golf. He's like, oh, yeah, he gets up every day oh, and yeah. plays golf. So having that sort of outlet obviously yeah. will help somebody like that. But uh, one of the great outlets that you continue to have is, of course, Great White and the new album, Full Circle. Mm -hmm. It's now available in all the different ways we talked about. Mm -hmm. You can go to officialgreatwhite.com. They're on Twitter, at Great White Rock. The YouTube channel is Official Great White. And uh, we only have about another minute, but I wanted to talk very quickly about how uh, Ter Terry Elu, I hope I'm saying his name right. I think Terry Elus. Elus. See, yeah. I was like, wait, no, I remember, because I talked to him, and it's been just long enough that I forgot how to say his name, Elus. He's That's great. A tough name. He's a great singer, and yeah. you really hear that on the album. He's the quote unquote new guy in the band, but he's been around, what, five years now? Six Seven. Years? Seven years. So, uh, <laughs> but just very briefly, talk about what he's brought to the band and collaborating with him and, and how uh, much. Great energy, for one thing. Mm -hmm. um, he's real creative. He's a total musician. I mean, he can play guitar 
guitar. He write, he's a songwriter. Um, you know, just positive energy in general. Um, he's into martial arts. He doesn't drink or smoke. So there's no, like, distractions like that, yeah. you know. Um, and it's pretty cool. I mean, literally, you know, we don't smoke or drink anymore. So it's just all about the music, and there's no drama. And, uh, you know, he really... He never sings the wrong note. That's one thing I notice. Yeah. And he told me he was sick one time and still did a great show. So I go, I don't even have to worry when this guy <laughs> even when he's flow. sick. Yeah, he'll be you know, fine. I mean, uh, that's awesome. Well, and that's uh, fully evidence on the new album, Full Circle, as I said, available at officialgreatwhite.com, at Great White Rocks. And Mark Kendall is at Mark Kendall underscore GW. Mark, thank you so much for coming up and spending so much time with me. I really thanks, appreciate buddy. it. It was a great conversation. Appreciate it, man. All right, thanks so much. Show. And thanks, everybody. We'll uh, talk to you next time. From executive producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.